Okay, so are you ready? Are you ready to bark? That's the best you can do? Wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that wasn't very good. I might give you a chance later on. I'm not sure. So, um, what are the attributes of a creative person in your mind? Adjectives to describe a creative person. Raise your hand, please. Yes. A mess. Good. Messy person. Messy person. Messy, yes. Huh? Handsome? Sensitive. Sensitive, good. Yes? Half crazy. Half crazy, half. okay. Half. Which half? Okay. Yes, more ideas. Colorful? Yes, I found. Intensity. Intensity, good. Yes? Colorful. Colorful is good. Yes? Non conformist. Non conformist is fine. I'm not sure I know what that is. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what a conformist is. Uh, okay, so uh, any more adjectives before I describe my list to you? No, shall we go on? Yeah. We only have 45 minutes, okay. Um, so before I do that, uh, let's discuss why is it good to be creative? Because creativity is something we talk about all the time, but not all of us uh, always know why it is good to be creative. So I've made a list of, of reasons why it's good, and I'm gonna get rid of my phone, which is my first creative step here. Okay, here I am back again, hi. Okay, so uh, why is it good to be creative? Well, first of all, I don't know whether you knew this, but more creative people make 23% more money than other people. <laughs> secondly, yes, secondly, creative people live an average of 2.3 years longer than regular people. Creative people smile and laugh an average of 27.3 times per day as opposed to only 19.6 times a day for regular people. But perhaps most importantly, creative people like to invent their own statistics. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I asked you for some adjectives to describe creative people. I'm going to give you now my list and see whether you agree. Would you agree that creative people are curious, yes. imaginative, intrepid? Intrepid is fearless, uh, courageous, yes? Um, stubborn, okay? Are they uh, not afraid of making mistakes? Hmm? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Creative people can be afraid of making mistakes. Okay, well, then they need the, my barking class, okay? Um, are they not afraid of appearing silly? Huh? It depends. It depends. Of course it depends, but for example, my... Creative mentor, Dr. Yossi Vardi, says that silliness and the ability to appear silly and not to be afraid to make mistakes is the ABC of being creative and innovative. Uh, but we can discuss that. Um, do creative people ask a lot of questions? Okay. Uh, do they have flexible boundaries? Do they have a connective type of thinking where they associate things that are not supposed to be associated with one another? Yes or no? Yes. And are they a very observant? Okay, what kind of people have you just described? Ourselves. Huh? Please pick up your hand. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. Integrated design, Kids. of course. Huh? Kids. What age? Um, five. First of all, I think that you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> um, according to thinkers in this area, we're talking about children from the age of about two, two and a half to the age of six or seven. So all we've done here is we've given a description of a regular young kid. That's what we've done, haven't we? Uh, then the question which we ask ourselves is what happens to these young children? Because as young children, as soon as we're born, we start to be experimentalists, right? 
we drop things, enough things fall on the ground, we deduce that there's something called gravity, right? Um, we see lots of things smiling, so we deduce that that's a smile. Um, from a very early age, we, we learn to recognize patterns and we do a lot of experiments when we're growing up. Uh, and this is me at the age of about three doing one of my early experiments, trying to grow watermelons. The only trouble is that it's Canada and it's winter time. Uh, but I was, I was intrepid. Um, so um, what happens to the young children? <coughs> well, the young children are put into correctional facilities. Um, this is my correctional institution when I was uh, four and a half years old. Uh, the Charles Hulse uh, Public School. I went to kindergarten there and they tried to make a uh, serious, obedient person out of me. They failed miserably. Um, because uh, in the approach of taking a person and making him into a serious person, uh, there were two obstacles in order to make me a serious person. The first, of course, was that I was Jewish. Uh, so every morning we had to pray to Jesus and I had to close my eyes and uh, be silent. And I was warned uh, that if I opened my eyes during prayer, uh, that I would see something terrible. So of course I opened my eyes and, <laughs> and the truth is I, I did see something very terrible and that was my kindergarten teacher staring back at me. Um, <laughs> and of course the, the, the second, my second problem uh, w was that I'm left-handed. How many of you are left-handed? Um, I suggest that we have a talk someday on growing up in a world where everybody's right-handed and just 10% of the people are left-handed because I've discovered that actually more people are left-sided than we previously thought. But that's another topic. So here I was, left-handed in Canada in the early 1950s when writing with your left hand or thinking with your right brain was considered a, a deviation. So it wasn't, it wasn't only that I was a Jewish kid in a Christian environment, I was also left-handed. So they spent a whole year taking the crayon from my left hand, putting it to my right hand, I would put it back. And I learned something very important that year. Uh, and I learned that uh, in order to get through school and to, and to get through life indeed, you cannot really trust teachers and you cannot really trust adults. Because even if they're best meaning, okay, they have all kinds of theories and and plans for you that sometimes go against the way that you exist. You know, to be a young Jewish kid in left hand, it was part of myself. It wasn't something that someone was going to wrest from me at the age of five. You follow? And as a biologist, you know, biologists wonder why fish never close their eyes. Do you know why fish never close their eyes? Huh? They don't you, 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 but you're giving me the non-design answer. Yeah, no, the, the actual reason is, I'm telling you the right answer, is that, not that that's wrong, uh, that the reason that fish never close their eyes is because they're afraid if they do so, someone will take them and take them away to school. <laughs> uh, and of course there are fish who, yeah, there are yes, th th there are fish who go to school. Uh, when we talk about schools of fish, we're talking about sardines or herrings, and they love to go to school. And the reason they love to go to school is because as a biologist, they're afraid of being predated, right? You know, a big fish, a shark comes along, and he sees 10,000 fish, and they all look the same, and they all swim to the left together, and they all swim to the right together. He gets all farmished, right? He doesn't know which fish to attack. He gets all confused, right? That is how schools of fish escape predation. There's even a song about it, which I will sing to you now. It goes something like this. All the big fish are swimming after me. They may catch the others, but they won't catch me. They may catch the others, but they won't catch me. They may all. <laughs> um, so, uh, and of course, the idea of going to school is to become an obedient and conforming adult, isn't it not? So that we can enter the sardine tin of life. And sometimes, uh, in the sardine tin of life, um, your head doesn't fit in. And there, there's solutions for that, too, as you see here. Uh, but the important thing is to conform. Um, and I don't know how many of you noticed the, uh, the fish at the top right. 
The fish at the top right is what I call a misfish. How many of you noticed him? The left-handed people noticed the misfish. So this is what I call a misfish. Um, this is the fish that the sharks are going to predate and eat, right? They're the ones that stand out. There's only one problem, and that is uh, that as a biologist you realize that schools of fish and schools of people worked for hundreds of thousands of years. When the main predators of, of fish, for example, were sharks and bigger fish, right? Over the past 50 or 100 years, who are the biggest predators of, uh, of fish? We are. We are. We with sonars and lunars, and we trap them in, in ships, and we gobble them up. And do we look for individual fish, or do we look for the schools? We track the schools of fish, right? The only ones who get away are the misfish. So uh, this has happened also in society. So maybe in the world that I was growing up in, my parents, my grandparents, thought that in order to, uh, to uh, fit into the world, you did have to be right-handed, you did have to conform. But in this modern day, it's actually the misfish who make a living. So many jobs, you know, 10,000s and hundreds of people, uh, being an, an elevator man when I was a kid. There's so many jobs that don't exist anymore. Computers have taken a lot of jobs away. So actually, it's the misfish now who have a better chance of surviving than the regular people. Um, and because my lecture is called uh, What I Learned in Kindergarten, I'm actually one of the only people that you know that have saved their kindergarten uh, card from uh, over 55 years ago. And I keep it with me. And the reason I do is because I read all these kind of things. Uh, Melvin is a very nervous child. Uh, he is overcoming the crying habit a bit. He tries hard and makes a good effort, of course, because they were witches. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that I really never completed kindergarten in an emotional way. I came into school realizing that I was in a kind of a correctional institution. I had to learn. I had to get the right answers, right? But I couldn't trust my teachers. And I learned that at the age of five. I've even written a book about it called Jeff the Misfish, starring Jeff Pulver, meets Jimmy the Whale, who's another one of my heroes, uh, Jimmy Wales. And this is a story about a fish that gets kicked out of school uh, for asking too many questions and wearing purple goggles. So this leads me <coughs> to my next question, which is, what is the one most important thing that they try to teach us in school? And please pick up your hand. That's the first thing. Yes. Huh? To what? No. 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 Raise your hand. No. Follow rules? No. What is the one most important thing they try to teach us in school? Yes. Huh? One second. Saifan, you have to raise your hand here. Even if you're a lecturer. Yes, I'll, I'll call you in a minute. Yes, Saifan. That there is only one most important thing. One of the most important what? Answer. That there is one. Most That's right. Important there is thing. only one important answer, answer to this question and to every question. I think you deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and I know that that's what you were going to say. <laughs> okay, so, you know, if you managed to finish kindergarten, and most of us did, they put us in grade one, right? In grade one, we get taught things like uh, two plus two equals, right? So uh, two plus two equals, let's not always see the same hands. Yes? Who knows how much two plus, you all finished grade one, so some of you must know the answer. It's not a trick question. Four. Huh? Four. No. <laughs> of course four. <laughs> two and two equals four. But two and two can also equal 11, for example. And two and two can equal one, because if you ask a young child, he might say if you take two drops of water, and you put them together with two other drops of water, you still have one drop of water. And why would somebody say that 2 plus 2 equals 11 if they only have three fingers? <laughs> right? You, you'll have to worry about that at home. Okay. Um, so in the story, in Jeff's class is Mr. Octopus, and because he has eight tentacles, 
he teaches all his students that 4 plus 4 equals 10, which is what you would teach your students if you were an octopus. Okay? <laughs> Jeff wonders why that is, and as a result, he gets kicked out of school, and he has to go and learn about the universe on his own. Um, so, because you know what 2 plus 2 is, I'm assuming everybody knows, you are now in grade 3 or 4, and uh, we have difficult questions. For example, um, division using fractions. Now, how many of you remember how to get the right answer to this question? Michal. No? Okay, so what do you do? That's right. Make a um, multiple. Okay. Can, okay. Wonderful. So that's wonderful, and that's why you're head of the library. And um, as so, now I have to ask you the, the question that's bothering me now. If you know the right answer, you remember it for so many years. Can you explain it to the rest of the class? Why you inverted the second a, um, fraction and then multiply? Can you explain why you do that? Can anybody in this class actually explain? How many of you knew how to do that? Right, because we learned it. Did any of you think that perhaps when you're learning mathematics that there should be an explanation for it? Until you have a child that goes in the first grade, then you know. No, but so the, the, the answer is, Saifat, that only when you have a child who asks you. And most children don't ask because they've learned that asking is not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is no, to learn. They, in Israel, in Israel, they ask. So how many, all these children have parents, and you asked your parents, how many of you know to explain why you do this? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, so this is the right answer, and Saifan knows why. Okay. So one day, Mr. Oyster, the principal, called me to his shell. This is Jeff talking. Jeff, I am sorry, Mr. Oyster said, but you just don't fit in here. You behave differently. You don't even look the same. Perhaps somewhere there's a school where all our fish have goggles and like to ask questions, but not here. Here you're a miss fish. Have a nice life. So um, now, since you've all known all the answers so far, um, you're on your way to university, and um, I'm going to ask you a question from the uh, psychometric exam. Which of these letters is different than the other letters? Which of these letters is the one that stands out? And you only have one minute to get the right answer. Please pick up your hand. Yeah. Why? It's high? Higher. Higher. Higher, okay, yes? The only one that is close. Okay. Okay. It's actually not a vowel, but I'm giving you a hint. Yes? It's not? Oh, only a designer would see that. <laughs> and I'm not. So that's not the right answer, clearly. So what's the right answer? <coughs> Dror, what do you say? Okay, in order to solve this question properly, and by the way, L is the right answer, but in order to solve this, pro uh, this question properly, you need to know Russian. Кто говорит по-русски? Очень хорошо. Что это по-английски? S. S. Что это по-русски? S. Что это по-еврейски? S. S. Это нет.